Well, I think it's about time to get this stompy bug finished up. <laughs> just to catch you up if you have not seen the previous videos in this build series um, everything's obviously painted decaled panel lined post shaded um, and I have the chipping done so all that's really left to do is put on uh, fluid and environmental effects so that's going to be the focus of this video now a few months back I did um, a series of videos in the basic skills series that cover adding uh, fluid stains and fuel stains and things like that. Um, there should be a link popping up somewhere up here about now uh, if you want to go back and look at those. But they simply covered uh, the very basics of it and using various uh, acrylics, oils, enamels, and things like that. It's just kind of an introduction to how are those applied. This video I'm going to focus on more advanced application and I'm going to be focusing on the use of acrylic products. And for the weathering process that I'm going to be covering in this video, I'm going to be sticking to acrylics. Now, it's I think it's worth noting, um, if you've not weathered with acrylics, it's not like weathering with oils and enamels. Oils and enamels are a subtractive process. You put some oil or enamel on, and then you get some thinner on your brush, and you blend it in, and you stipple it, and you do these things to remove some of the product from the model, and what you leave behind produces an oil stain or a streak or something like that. With acrylics, because of their very fast drying time, you want to add, think of it as an additive process where you're adding those things on gradually until you build it up to get the look that you want. So I'll be using a lot of um, very thin layers, um, uh, really working with the opacity of the products by adding water and other things um, to reduce the opacity and then putting them on in smaller amounts and building it up. Now, in terms of the application, it doesn't necessarily save time over oils and enamels. However, when you're applying these acrylic products, um, once you've got them on, you're about 20 seconds away from a quick hairdryer blast to being able to put the next product right on over it without any worry about um, it pulling up or you know blending in or something like that. So uh, that's what appeals to me is the speed with which I can work um, because, you know, as I get these videos done, I need to work fairly quickly. So that's why I like using acrylics. I do use oils and enamels and I'm very comfortable with them, but more and more I'm finding that acrylics fit very well within my own workflow and it's a good skill to have. Now the first thing I'm going to do is apply dust effects to the model. Now Obviously, this is going to represent dust, but I always like to think about the environment that it's going to be in. Um, and I don't use just one color of dust because there's going to be various, um, you know, various mixtures of it, various depths of earth. You know, if you've, if you've walked around the woods, you know you find some areas that have slightly different colors of dirt and dust, and it can be affected by just about anything. So I, I rarely use just one color. But I also think about, okay, is the area that I'm going to depict this being in, is it one that has a lot of moisture or is it very dry? Because if it's very dry, the dust is going to be more of a solid effect, whereas if it's in a more moist environment, the dust will collect on it, then condensation will collect on it, say in the mornings, and that condensation will run down the vehicle eventually. And it will it also, as it dries, it will pool the dust and make different patterns in the dust. So it's just one of those great ways that we can overthink our models. But I think in terms of doing that, now I think streaking is more interesting than just a solid layer of dust. But that's that's the, the theory that I put behind it. Now the three colors that I'm primarily using for my dust are this uh, European dust, uh, gray, and desert dust. Now what I'm going to do for the upper surfaces is I'm going to desaturate each of them with just a little bit of this model wash just to lighten it up a bit. And I'll do that in my metal palette right here. And I'll just pick one of the colors to start with and wick off most of it onto this paper towel. I'm just using this cheap liner brush here. 
All I'm going to start doing is just flicking that on there like this. Now, for my initial pass, I'm going to go pretty much from the top of the side surfaces down to this lower um, part here. So I'm going to cover it pretty much fully. Now on those more upturned surfaces, I'm going to do something a little different with those later. But I'm just going to go in and add these streaks just randomly. The reason I'm doing the flicking motion is that allows me to get just the tip of the brush on there and keep them from getting too much looking like I'm just painting paint on, which is really all I'm doing. <laughs> then once I get the first layer on, I'll switch to the next color and just start putting that on like this. They're going to go on, uh, some of the colors especially, are going to go on much more opaque than they will actually dry. They will dry much, much more transparent. Now I'm not necessarily waiting for each layer to dry. I'm just putting them on one over the other. Um, randomization says that some of the streaks won't overlap. And uh, if they do and they mix a little bit, that's fine. I, now that I've got all three of those colors on there, I start the process again. I occasionally stir the wash in my palette. But this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to start it up just a little, little lower down the model like this and just pick kind of an arbitrary line. I'm going about two-thirds of the way down the surface this time. and I'm just putting that on. What this is going to do is it's going to make the dust look a little thicker further down the model. Now it's still drying, but you can see the effect of that streaking there on those areas where I put it. That's um, three layers essentially. One full layer, then one two-thirds down, then one one-third down. But you see how it adds, especially up here on the front, You can, I think you can see it pretty well. Um, you see how it adds what essentially, if you were using uh, oils, would be a dot filter effect. It's basically the same principle, just a slightly different application method. Now on the top of the model, there's two ways that I do it because it's not going to be quite as streaked up here, but rather it's going to gather on it. Now some surfaces like this one, there's going to be certainly some streaking. So you can just streak it along like that. But on the more flat surfaces, I just like to stipple the paintbrush around is one of the things that I do. And then on larger areas, I'll actually just touch a sponge just into the wash and then get most of that off and then just go onto the surface and begin sponging some of that on on those flat surfaces like that. If you get a little too much on, just use the dry edge of the sponge to touch to it and pick up the excess. Here you can see the, the first pass of those washes sponged on. It's a very faint effect but it's built up and works really well. I do a little bit of overlap with the streaking going down where the streaks start to kind of blend those together um, just to kind of help blur the line between the streaks and the sponging. Now on the underside I'll use the same three washes that were the basis for the colors that I put on the top. This time instead of adding white to lighten them I'm going to add a drop of this dark gray model wash to darken them. Now this is um, admittedly this is a step that you have to constantly stir these. This is a step that is, is probably not necessary. Um, sometimes I like doing things just because um, maybe it makes me feel special or something. <laughs> but but all I'm going to do with this is I'm going to apply this with um, a sponge and it's going to be uh, designed to just enhance those shadows, enhance the, the volume of the model to make it appear as if this is more in shadow, this is a little darker, um, maybe just to give it a little more of a sense of size and scale and things like that. So the application is the same, just get it on the sponge dab it off a little bit, go to another color, dab it off, and just keep applying it and spreading it around until you get it looking like you want. Now just in case you're wondering, um, when it comes to the legs, I'm going to just use 
uh, the lighter versions of these colors. I'm not going to go with the darker versions. I don't know that it'll make that much difference because the surfaces are so small. But what I'm going to be doing on these is just purely a sponge application. It's really, it gets to looking a little contrived, I think, when you start streaking on such a small area because they tend to um, get a little wide and they look a little more painted on than they do on these broader surfaces here. So I'm going to be going completely with sponge um, application of the dust effects on the legs. Now with the dust applied, I'm going to start adding mud. And I think there's several considerations to take into mind when you're applying the mud. One is, of course, keeping the color consistent. You want the mud color to generally be consistent with what you had been doing for the dust. Um, because the dust comes from the dirt, and the dirt is what makes the mud when mixed with water. So it's all kind of consistent. Um, and if you just observe the real world, you know that, that a light layer of dust is going to be lighter than if you take a handful of the dirt, which is going to be a little darker. And then if you add water to it, it generally gets darker than that and is a little glossy. So when it comes to mud effects, um, I like to take advantage of all of those. Now on this vehicle in particular, the way I'm going to, I guess you'd say, analyze where the mud needs to go is, of course, there'll be some down here on the feet. Now, the feet aren't going to collect a lot because they're pointy little crab toes. Um, but if this were some kind of flat thing or other thing, whatever model you're building, just look at it and, and look at it and think, where would the mud collect on that? Now, certainly underneath, there's going to be mud because as these feet are, you know, crabbing along, they're going to create splashes and things like that. So I'm going to assume that there's going to be a certain amount of splash mud that gets up under here and it's going to coat this pretty well um, because there would be a lot of dust, a lot of dirt, and probably a little mud. You don't have to have mud on it, but I think it just helps to kind of distinguish all of those things and just gives something of some visual interest. Now to start off, I'm going to use this light brown textured earth from Wilder Weathering Products. Now, unfortunately, Adam Wilder is no longer selling um, his, uh, his weathering products, so it's a little harder to find these uh, now than uh, it was when I first purchased it, uh, but it's still, you can still find it on the market. And certainly there are other textured earth products. This is not just some brown coloration. This has some very fine grain in it. It's just, it just gives me some texture. Now, if the texture product you have is not the color you want, don't worry about it because you can paint and wash over any of the mud. And you'll see that I'm putting it on here fairly heavily, but then I'm going back and I'm just cleaning some off because I think you don't necessarily have to have a thing covered in mud to suggest that it's muddy. Um, you can certainly do that. I mean, and we know in the real world, things do get very muddy. But I think having areas of some heavy mud, some collections of mud, and then some places where the mud may not be as heavy, despite the fact that you would think it would be, while that may not be as realistic, I think what it does is it allows some of the detail that you've already put into it to show through. Now on the underside, I'm going to use the same, uh, same textured earth product. Now up here in, I, I guess you, you wouldn't call them the, we almost called it the wheel wells. I guess it's the leg wells. Um, up here in the leg wells, I'm going to be okay with going a little heavier. So I'm going to give this a good coating of it up in here. And then along the bottom side, I'm just going to do more of that stippling, impl imparting a little bit of the texture on and getting that muddy, but then occasionally washing my brush off in my water, dabbing off a little on a paper towel, and then just coming back and blending that just a little bit so that it's not quite so heavy and lets some of that chipping and other detail and things like that show through to, again, sell the notion of mud. And I just keep building up these layers until it gets to the point that I think I want it to be at. Now here you can see it kind of in progress. I'm obviously not completely done with it, but 
this is the first layer of mud added on and then I just I just hit it with a hair dryer briefly to dry it up but you see the light texture that's on there and the muddy color and things like that later um, uh, additions of more mud and then some of those washes and some other products are going to much better sell the notion that this is a muddy thing. Now once that textured earth is dry I'm going to use some European dust again. This time I'm going to add in some oiled earth to uh, what I'm doing and that's just going to be for the recesses um, just to make some deeper shadows. All I'm trying to do here is just shift the color of that textured earth that I applied to something more consistent with the dust effects that I've already applied. And this just goes right over and it basically uh, tints the, the textured earth product. It'll leave some staining on the paint, but that's okay because it just looks consistent with the rest of uh, what I've already applied. I'm applying this very wet. I'm not, I'm not worried about if it's, you know, I'm not stippling it on or doing it, you know, in any petite precious kind of way and then I'll come in here to the wheel wells uh, the, the leg wells and places like that where there's going to be a little more shadow and then I'll come over here and get some of this oiled earth and put that in there just to deepen those shadows a little bit and I'm just wet blending that I'm not even worried about trying to to keep them really distinct and then I just come back and just keep applying the European earth I'll also use the European dust wash to uh, paint on the the color on the textured earth that I put onto the legs both at the the joints where it connects with the rest of the model and down here on his pointy crab feet. Now I've added the legs on so I can start evaluating it as a whole and what I've done is I've mixed some of this desert dust and the European dust into my palette here and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start speckling that color on just to give a little more tonal variety in terms of the color of the dirt. And I'm going to be very heavy with the application because it's going to dry much more uh, transparent than it goes on. But the more that I put on there, the more that it will just sell the notion of a muddy, splashy thing. I want to start adding some fluid stains to the model, both around the fuel cap and on the joints and other moving parts, things like that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with this Citadel Agrax Earth Shade. Now this is the matte version, the flat version. And so I'm going to come in here and I'm going to put this on uh, fairly heavily because this will do a couple of things for me. One, it'll sell the notion of a fuel stain. Two, it'll help bring out that detail. I'm going to put that on there and I'm just going to draw it down like that to kind of create the staining and things like that. Now this is going to represent fuel that has been spilled and has dried up and has taken on kind of a matte appearance to it. And I can bring this further down like it just goes on down the side of the model. Maybe get a little here on the leg even. But I'll get this on here real heavy like that and then I'll hit it briefly with the hair dryer. Now you can see that dried very matte and so what I want to do is I'm going to go in over it with this Vallejo fuel stains. I'm going to be much more direct about my application here. Just put a little on like that maybe stipple a few little dots here and there. This is going to dry gloss and so there will be some contrast between more spread out fuel stain and this fresher gloss stain. Now I'm doing this for the sake of demonstration because I am going to put a matte coat over this. If you were doing this in production I guess you'd say then you would want to put the gloss on after you did a matte coat because obviously the matte coat is going to matte that down but I think it works for the sake of demonstration and I can go back and add over it later. I can pick other areas for just various fluid stain looks like right here. I'm just going to drop in a bunch of the Agrax Earth Shade just to give that an oily appearance. This will dry uh, matte, and uh, which is what I want. So it'll help define it a little bit, but it'll also just give it an oily look um, 
and it'll be in contrast to this area. I'm not really thinking why are the two different. I'm just thinking, hey, they're different. So that'll be good enough. And then on areas like here on the joints, things like that, you can just apply some in there. Um, have some streak down. Same way with down in the joints here. Uh, you can apply it. It'll kind of define the dirt a little bit. But you might have fluid leaks there because with these legs moving, there's going to be a lot of fluid dynamics happening. So it won't be um, unusual for there to be some kind of leak or stain or things like that. Now as I apply this, I'll switch it up and I'll probably use a little bit of Citadel Non Oil too, which is black, but it'll just sell a notion of different kinds of stains. And you just put these wherever you think that there might be some kind of fluid leak from hydraulics or oil or any other kind of lubricant or anything like that. The key is using multiple colors and multiple finishes, gloss or matte or satin, is really going to help sell the notion that there's something going on there of interest. All right, well, I think I'm going to go ahead and call this a video. Um, I've got this mostly finished. Um, my, my goal for this video is to talk about uh, the various weathering techniques and kind of to take, as I'd mentioned, to take what I had talked about in the basic uh, series on each of these techniques and then combine them together here using acrylics, using multiple colors, using uh, just combining things together. And the goal is to show, uh, was to show that if you take those basic techniques and build upon them, then you're going to get something that is more than just the sum of the parts. Uh, at least I think so. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy with how this turned out in terms of weathering. I, I think it looks, it looks dirty. It looks used. But it doesn't look um, as if it's just, you know, completely fallen apart and, and uh, ready for the junk heap. It looks operational. Uh, there's still a few more things I'm probably going to do off camera uh, that are not related to the purpose of this video. I'm going to make the, the, the clear parts a little less shiny using a very, very light uh, acrylic wash over it. Uh, I may add some, you know, some cordite staining here. Someone once told me, you know, lasers don't make cordite stains. And I'm like, no, but Cordite stains let you know it's a shooty-shooty thing, so sometimes we do things like that. So anyway, I may do a few more changes, but um, I hope this video has been helpful in giving you some ideas on ways to use acrylic products in your weathering that you can get a very good result uh, using them and that it's really just a matter of layering them up, uh, working with their opacity, uh, working with the different colors, and just continually building it up until you get what it is that you want. Now another thing that I've not talked about uh, through the course of this uh, six video series, um, because I've been focusing on techniques, I've not talked about the model itself that much. Um, this is a fabulous, fabulous model. I have really enjoyed building it. Um, in fact, because I've been so focused on filming the techniques, I've had to sometimes step back and and think about um, how much I'm enjoying the build apart from the, the video work and all of that. If I would have just built this straight through without filming it, you know, I, I, I think it, it, it is a very, very fun kit. The fit is really good. It's very unique in its look. Um, it's a decent size. Um, it's about five inches long and about six inches across. Um, there's loads of diorama possibilities because it's in 135th scale. So there's a lot of additional parts that are available to be used with it. Um, and there's so much that you could do with it in terms of camouflage and markings and everything like that. So um, if you've never thought of uh, looking at a machining Krieger kit, or if you do like machining Krieger and have just not thought of getting this kit, um, I highly recommend it. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, I've really enjoyed putting it together. Now, you know the rest of the deal. There's the link down over here to subscribe. Um, and if you've not already done so, please do that. And uh, hit the uh, bell icon so you'll know when I have new videos out. 
There's also a place down below to leave your uh, comments. Please do leave comments. I always like hearing from people. Um, plus, it helps me grow the channel, and I'm grateful for that. And if you would, give this video a like. Um, that will also help me out a, a lot. Uh, speaking of the things down below, there are links to my social media, and there's links to Patreon. Um, if you would like to support the work that I do here on this channel, then please consider supporting me through Patreon. I would be most grateful for that, um, as it makes what I do possible. And of course, if you're already a Patreon supporter, um, I can't tell you how much it means to me and my family. We are so very blessed that you support the work that I do, um, because it allows me to to be supported in a way that I don't have to um, I don't have to worry about can I get these paints, can I get these kits, can I get these things that allows me to bring this content to people. Um, your support of that makes it possible. I just wouldn't be able to do it at the the frequency that I do it with the materials and the kits and everything else if it weren't for you. So, and, and I hope that you enjoy the benefits that you get as a patron, the additional videos each week, the, the updates in the build calendar uh, updates that I, I put out twice a month. I hope that you're enjoying those benefits the, and the exclusive video builds. Thank you very much for, for being a patron and, uh, and for supporting the work that I do. Now, with all that being said, I'll leave you with one final thought, as I always like to do. In this hobby, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.